Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to another exciting edition of Cambridge Inside Out. My name is Robert Winters, and uh, this week we have as our co-host, Mr. Patrick Barrett. Introduce yourself, sir. Well, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a you know a bold claim to say this is going to be an exciting edition, um, but you know it, it might it might be. I'm Patrick Barrett. I am co-chair of the Bid in Central Square, as well as the owner of the beautiful 907 Hotel, Dial Restaurant, and Blue Owl Rooftop Bar, uh, and uh, a staunch capitalist. <laughs> that is true. And as I, as I often like to say to people, I'm, I'm a staunch capitalist, but a very bad capitalist. <laughs> so, so anyway, Patrick, you were on this program yes, about sir. a month ago. Yep. And we primarily talked at that time about uh, a couple of pieces of business that are before Cambridge City Council currently, though not neither of which are put into effect, namely BUDO, which stands for Building, Building Energy Use Disclosure Ordinance. 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 So that's be beautiful, beautiful. <sighs> Yeah, and then, it and is the other pronounced word. Budo, not Beto or <laughs> Buedo or it's just Budo. All righty. So, uh, and then the other one is the, was the uh, what we what's technically referred to as incentive payments, uh, incentive zoning payments, yes. which uh, look, mainly goes through by the um, the term linkage, which, which is kind of a funny name, right? I don't I don't really feel an incentive uh, to do much with an incentive zoning payment. So. Right. It, it actually, I think in a way, linkage is a better term because what it basically, the, the, the idea was, is that if there's commercial development happening, even this, this all needs revision, of course, but commercial development happening may have an impact because if it's bringing job and putting a lot more demand on the housing stock or whatever, that therefore uh, a, uh, every square foot of development of larger projects, at least commercial development, yeah. should kick in some money into a fund that would then be used to, in some way, uh, relieve the pressure on uh, local housing. Sure. Is that fair? A fair <laughs> summary? That's fair. And, you know, in, in fact, there's been a lot of exciting new developments since last we spoke on this. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to speak to you about it. In particular, uh, the planning board, I think, for maybe the first time ever, uh, heard the methodology behind incentive zoning. And they continued the case, I was happy to say, um, because it seemed to be somewhat flabbergasting. Because as you just described, the methodology behind linkage is what they do is they try to determine which commercial use is going to have the highest impact on affordable housing. Now, which which use do you think would do that in the city right now? Like, about all the things we're building, all the things we can build commercially, what do you think has the biggest impact on housing? Well, I mean, if it was back in the 1980s, it would have been the explosive growth of the uh, the sort of the data, you know, computer industries okay. in Kendall Square and Lotus Development and things like, like that. that. But like today, that. Yeah. life science has taken over and it's all about the labs. Wrong! Wrong. So that is how the planning board, I believe, thought. I think that's how most people think that labs, because they bring in lots of high earners and those high earners in turn go and look into our neighborhoods for housing and in you know a very real way are able to pay lots more money, et cetera. But that's not how linkage works. The methodology behind linkage right now says that the type of industry drives who most likely will seek affordable housing. So the highest use, the, the highest impact use right now, according to the community development department, are restaurants. Because restaurants hire people at a lower wage, and therefore people who make a lower wage are more likely to seek uh, support for housing. Therefore, that use has the highest impact on incentive zoning fees. Well, this is really kind of insane. Yeah, uh, but, it is. but so now, now the debate, or really the what is the the matter of business that is before? I believe it would be the ordinance committee currently. Uh, yeah. Is really the proposal to add on to they they did an increase in the uh, amount of dollar per square foot. It used to be something right. about 12 bucks or something. And they kicked it up to, or it was so, actually, what was it again? I forget the number. 
In 2015, there was a big kerfuffle about this, and they raised it from like $3 to 12 with the idea it's going to increase a dollar. That was my dog in the background. That was Russell. I apologize. It's going to increase a dollar every year um, until I believe now we're, we're at $21 and change. And the city council's proposal is to bring it up to $34. Just so we have a basis of comparison, Somerville is currently at 12, and Boston, I believe, is somewhere between 10 and 18, but they're, they are also considerably lower than where we are right now. But there's a whole layer of nuance, which I know people hate, because um, we like for our issues to be somewhat black and white, read the headline, not the, not the subtext. Um, Boston's threshold for these linkage fees to kick in is 100,000 square feet. Somerville's is 30,000 and, and uh, Cambridge is 30,000. So you build a commercial building, 30,000 and one square feet, the entire building now will be taxed at that $21 and eventually the $33 rate because that's, that's just how it works. All right, so it seems to me that, that the ordinance committee is basically pondering the wrong questions right now. I, I mean, they're they're basically saying, well, it used to be three bucks and then it went to 12. It's probably up at 15, 16 or whatever now. And we want to basically double it because we're seeing this not so much in terms of incentive zoning or anything, really, mm -hmm. so much as just a cash cow that we can milk for uh, to get more money to put into for housing trust, which may be the mo world's most noble goal. But the well, question is, but it doesn't seem to me that that the. Um, the question before them should be to sort of look at the whole structure of what this incentive zoning is really. Well, uh, it, it was targeting. required as part of that 2015 change to look at it every three years, which might be an overly aggressive schedule, but that's what we've done. We have a 2019 Nexus study that was issued in November of 2019 that sort of shows what the impacts have been. And the good news is it's brought in a ton more money for affordable housing. That is true. Um, but if you look at the development schemes over the past 10 years in Cambridge, which was inclusive of this change, about 94% of what's being built in Cambridge uh, commercially is lap. Um, so when you think about how a city works and how, and from a planning perspective, what we've essentially told developers, if you're not building a lab, you're probably not gonna be financially viable. So if you want anything, like think of it in our cultural district, if we wanted to build a 30,000 square foot version of Starlight Square, which is that outdoor stage everyone seems to like, except for you know, the people who live next to it, um, you know, that, would, that would be taxed at the same linkage rate as a Pfizer lab at the same size. And you know, the, the, the interesting piece of that is one, it just, it just on its face seems kind of ludicrous that we would do that. But from the community development department standpoint, this is all part of doing business in Cambridge. You know, it, it was a frustrating point that you know, this, this is coming from the city council. We have a planning board hearing, which they continued really just to understand more how this system works. And you know, within five seconds, uh, you know, the uh, councilor Zondervan runs to Twitter to lambast the planning board is not caring about affordable housing. You know, I, I kind of feel like the affordable housing group, the, the people, the activists in this group, they're like a hammer and everything is a nail. They, yeah. they, they, there's no nuance to it. There's no, we need to build more than just labs and affordable housing. I'm sorry, it's just true. Right. I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think your most ardent housing advocates would suggest otherwise. You know, this, this sort of, I mean, I think what you're describing is what I would use call the sort of a one dimensional view of this entire enterprise. You know, they're seeing everything purely in terms of uh, fund generation for affordable housing, uh, whereas, in fact, they should be actually looking at sort of what the actual impacts are in terms of planning and development itself, and sure. not just the amount of money that can be generated. It kind of makes me, it reminds me in a kind of a twisted little way of what happened during that K2C2 process, where prior What's to that, K2C2? you made well, that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a few years ago. <laughs> uh, but back then, uh, if somebody said, well, what constitutes community benefit? Right. Um, 90 per, 95 percent of the react response would be, well, we need to put more money into the affordable housing trust to be affordable housing. Sure. And again, I'm not in any way denigrating the concept of affordable housing. But the thing that is would be what, sacrilege. 
that would be sacrilege. But it would be a heathen, and we'd have to drag you out of town. Sorry. Right, but there there was a glimmer of hope that that uh, came out of that process, which is that people started acknowledging mm -hmm. the fact that there are things like um, ground floor retail that mm -hmm. actually benefits communities, especially if it can be somehow made to, to be so called affordable you know, or yeah. you know, at least accessible in a reasonable sort of way, because that's actually what helps to build neighborhoods as well. And I think I celebrated this because I thought, well, okay, so it's not just one dimensionally talking about jacking up more money toward uh, basically to, to subsidize housing, but it was actually looking more broadly at other things of value. So and I, and, this is similar. I, th that to me has been my argument in a nutshell. There's just, there's more to life than labs and affordable housing. And I think if you want to, you know, I, before when I came here be, uh, to, to talk to you about this, I told you how I felt like zoning was sort of this roadmap about who we are. You know, it tells me what we care about if I'm, if I'm an alien landing from a distant planet. So if I showed up here, you know, but from a financial perspective, a, a lab will command an order of magnitude more rent than any other kind of use, literally any other kind of use. It's almost a, fi a factor of five. Um, when they're appraised by the banks and when the bank goes through their financial assessment of, of, of viability, a lab is going to command you know, three to four times the, over, the end value of a building of the same size in any other use category. So in a city like Cambridge, where you have a nice flow of, of traffic from universities, from the biotech industry, um, we need uh, restaurants, we need hotels, we need entertainment facilities. In the cultural district of Cambridge, I want to see, uh, you know, more music venues. I want to see more, more uses that, I, want, I mean, a Dave and Buster's is a pipe dream, but like, I want, I want things that, that draw us to our district that turn Central Square into the entertainment district it was always meant to be. But right now, everything tells me to build a lab. And it's not just for new construction. If I rehabilitate an existing building substantially, according to the language, that also will trigger incentive zoning. So any guy who's looking to rehabilitate an existing structure, he's literally looking at labs. It's the only thing that makes sense to build. And then you might get your nice little cafe in the first floor for the retail component. But that's, you know, that's, a, that's just the give me. It's like a throwaway at that point. Yeah, it's, it is you a know. throwaway. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it does seem to me politically when, you know, when you hear development proposals coming down the pike, it, you know, you know, it's, it's like you're waiting for the shoe to drop and then you say, oh, well, we're actually planning to put labs in. And then it becomes sort of the political fight about, well, how do we stop the lab because we don't want to have the lab here? You know, it's it's never a matter of, of uh, creating an attraction and incentives for the things you want. So it's here, more here. like, you know, you've decided that everything is one dimensional. So it's right. just a matter of and, and how I, are we going to do battle? And I love labs. Like, I think labs are great to some degree. I don't want only labs in the same way. I don't only want mattress stores. You know, it, you know, it is something that you have to think about in terms of how you plan a district. Do we turn Cambridge into one giant office park? And, you know, the, the, the reigning argument on the other side of this is that the fee is no big deal. And you, you've experienced, you've used math before, right, Robert? You, I, you know, I believe I, I have. I, there was oh, some flotsam and jetsam of my life. You're, you're going to be very, you're gonna be very helpful in this next lab, in this next math problem. Uh, a, a lab construction project, a, 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 the construction cost for a lab is about two to three times that of any other kind of build. So if I'm building, uh, you know, let's uh, say same size structure, if my, if my budget for a lab is $120 million, my same, my similar budget for a same size building of not a lab use is going to be around, you know, 45, 50 million, a little less than half, right? So a little, a little actually considerably less than half. But the, the, the point being is that on the, on the project that costs less, the static $22 or $34 fee is that much more of a percentage of my project. So when Aram Farouk and Quentin Zondervan, who both said, at, in the polling board hearing, that this is a de minimis cost. They're talking about $120 million labs where that linkage fee goes down to about 1% because it costs more. Right. And, <laughs> and, 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 that, and it's just like, it's that kind of nonsense that drives me bonkers because all you have to, it, it, it's, it, it's so stupid that you, you kind of dismiss it because you're like, I'm sure these people know what they're talking about, but I, I just don't think that they do. 
especially you know, it, in the case of Zondervan. It, it, uh, it, you know, it seems to me that, you know, going back a hundred, nearly a hundred years, the purpose of zoning, this is long before anybody talked about things like incentive zoning and, and yeah. linkage and any of this stuff. Zoning was, you know, it was about attracting that which you wanted into certain areas and preventing that which you didn't want in certain areas. You didn't want to build the, uh, you know, the the rendering plant next to the kindergarten and things like that. Right. So zoning was was really supposed to be the tool for guiding a lot of this. Uh, and when incentive zoning rolled around, and I guess it would have been the mid to late 80s or something, the, um, the idea was that, well, this isn't really going to affect the planning so much is it's right. just going to because the, the what's going to happen is going to happen we just want to make sure that we're going to address the impacts of what was going to happen because of it which but, back know, then we, it cost three dollars a foot exactly so, exactly you know, but, but you know, in, a a, in a place like central square or harvard square i mean right. or really any any kind of place that we think of as kind of a place that should have a little bit of everything we want yeah. rather than everything we're sort of stuck with right yeah. um that that there ought to be better planning that actually builds in incentives to bring in the things that we want oh my god incentives stop it we don't do that developers are evil capitalist monsters that want to you know rain sadness for a thousand years upon us all they i, I have to know as a developer um, I don't eat food like you do. Um, just <laughs> the general sadness of the population is what drives me. So, you, you know, the the incentive piece of, of what you're talking about, like we can do that and not till what's what's happening right now is I've, I've floated a few ideas out there to sort of help people think differently about how this all works. Um, but uh, my dogs might attack each other in a minute. Sorry. Um, but the, 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 the way that I look at it is like, in Central Square, for instance, you don't ever want to build a lab, right? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but you want everything else. So why, why would we not just block labs in Central Square and get rid of the incentive zoning fee for Central Square? Because it's never going to happen. All right, now, see, now, now you're thinking creatively. And, is that allowed? It, is that allowed? Yeah, it is absolutely frowned upon. But right. a, moreover, the, the reason why people are afraid to touch it is because linkage hangs by a legal thread. It's really something that we all kind of, when I say we, the evil developer cabal that I actually don't belong to, they don't like to have me sit at their tables, believe me. Um, but it's like an agreement, right? They agree to pay this thing. And they know they don't really typically challenge it. But if you actually traced it back, like we just did in the methodology of it, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it would, it, would, it would stand the test in any court. That being said, um, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, thresholds for the sizes of buildings. Boston uses 100,000 square feet as their link is threshold. Why do they do this? Because nothing really expensive happens in a building that's less than 100,000 square feet. It's just true. The bigger developments, you need a certain footprint for a lab, you need a certain size to get critical mass. In fact, our own 2019 Nexus study says that uh, though the projects that reached the 30,000 square foot threshold all stayed below it. And then of the 28 projects that actually were paying into this fund, each individual project combined was bigger than all of those nine projects combined to over 167,000 square feet. So if you just raise the threshold to 50,000 or 100,000, you're not taking a dime from the trust. No money is there on, is on that table at all. But what you are doing is allowing for all these other types of, no one's gonna build 100,000 square foot Applebee's, right? That's not gonna happen. No, right. but someone's gonna build a multi-tiered entertainment complex because you just took 8% of their budget and gave it back to them. Because right. that's that's what it, that's what the, that's what the impact really is for the now, lab. Pat, Pat, one Patrick, I, I do feel I have to warn you. You're thinking creatively, oh, and that's so. simply not permitted. It's because I'm wearing my Dollywood hat. <laughs> okay, right. Anyway, so uh, so that's what's before the council yep. or before the ordinance committee. Yet not yet to the council, but I imagine whenever it grows so, out of the ordinance committee, it'll just get waved through. But, so but I, I just wish they would take a giant step back and just rethink the structure of the incentive zoning ordinance itself a little bit to get to get better uh, quality output rather than just more money. 
If the goal is to build more affordable housing and the goal is to get more money to fund affordable housing, there are other better, more effective ways to do it. And that's a fact. And other places do this. There's other ways to grab tax revenues. There's other ways to incentive other types of development. There's other ways to you know, manipulate our current inclusionary ordinance, which effectively destroys any mid-sized residential developments to actually foster these bigger things. But like I learned in my Buto discussions, people like me, people who are in the lower threshold of development are not invited to the table. And CDD is really only, only wants to work with the top four large developers, MIT and Harvard, and that's it. They would prefer so, so, we didn't exist. So you 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 bring us back to the question of Budo. Yeah. All right. Now now when you were here last year a month ago, yeah. Uh, you know you actually educated me quite a bit on um, on some of the particulars having to do with electrical infrastructure and some of the demands, some of the impossibilities, and whatever. Now, um, since then, what are what are some of the repercussions of some of that discussion? Because I know that so there were a lot of people at that point who didn't really even know what was coming down the pike, who apparently now are alerted. So, so tell us uh, some more. I've talked to over uh, you know, uh, groups representing 700 individual condominium owners. So we're in these buildings that will be wrapped up in Budo. Um, I'm just right now just getting the word out. I'm not doing it in an inflammatory way. I'm just more of a matter of fact, because I think the facts alone kind of speak for themselves. You know, and speaking of, uh, if you're a Buto property owner, you're about to receive a letter from me and the chamber and a bunch of other groups um, that explain what Buto is. There's about 4,280 of you out there. Um, and those letters went out this afternoon. Um, and it has my name on it. So, you know, if you, you know, where we, you can find where I live and throw a rock from my window if you don't like it. Um, but I think I believe in transparency. And if we're going to have a discussion about something as important as climate change, we should really be transparent, honest, and put together a plan that actually can work. So right now, you'll be shocked to find, Robert, uh, no one knows about this at all, other than MIT, Harvard, um, and a few of the larger properties that are really represented by the KSA and Kendall Square. Now, I have something next to me I want to just flash up on your screen. <laughs> um, this is part of the reason why this is problematic right now. So MIT, Harvard, and Harvard made a commitment to be net zero by 2026. But their version of net zero is that they buy carbon credits and they, you know, it's more of a shell game. Um, right. Know, it's, and, uh, it's, it's fighting climate change through creative accounting. Well, yeah. And, and, but in the same way, Cambridge has said, you know, and this is Quentin Zondervan and Patty Nolan, and uh, to some extent, Sumbul Siddiqui, uh, Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui, have said, you know, we don't want you to buy those credits. We want you, we want to, we want to tax you through what's called an uh, alternative compliance credit system which effectively it means we believe that the carbon tax credit system is a way to buy out of climate change and it's not really getting, getting the job done. But we think when you buy those credits from, when we tax you in Cambridge, that's fine because um, I don't have an answer because it's all, it's both, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. We just, right. just, just, just wanna make sure that they're getting the money and not anybody else because they think they can do something better with it or. God knows what they call it a new green deal, but there is no new green deal in Cambridge, at least not right. legislatively. So, so in the spirit of having the wrong discussion, sure. All right, I want to just that. offer something here because you know I, I sit on the Central Square Advisory Committee, and there was a project that came before us at 50 Bishop Allen Drive, where yeah. uh, the, you know, and it was you basically tear down a kind of a tired old building and. Yeah, and, and put in one that's a little bit taller, a little bit more consistent with what people find perfectly acceptable these days. It's not a huge building or anything like that. But, um, but in it, I, the one objection I had uh, when it, we first saw it was I said, do you really have to have all that big iron grid on the front of the building? Right. Said, well, we need that for the um, electrical infrastructure. Yeah. See, now, and now I understand a little bit more yeah. just how burdensome some of this can be. So. And that so but that's since a new building. Then, that's a new that building. is a new building but since that they actually came back mm -hmm. uh before the central square advisory committee again and i i said well okay so what are what are the changes well we've decided now we're going to have we're going to go all electric i mm -hmm. said oh really so and what changes are there to the facade did you we did you somehow find a way to manage to minimize that sort of obtrusive really kind of bad design which kind of makes the ground floor kind of dreadful and they said no we actually had to make it bigger 
<laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, okay, Patrick, you got that right. And, you know, I'm not the, lying. I'm not, no. I'm not I, I, honestly, like, I, I know people have suspicions of me because I'm a developer, I'm an attorney. Um, as uh, Susan Fleischer will remind me, I used to, I, I did at one point in time wear a, a Romney Ryan hat to a Cambridge uh, meeting, which I thought was <laughs> hysterical at the time. Yes, but, I remember that. Um, yeah. It was, uh, but, it, but the, the point is, like, there's a way to do some of this stuff. And we keep getting sort of these false um, uh, promises from city councilors. And like, there's a group called Mothers Out Front. Hi, mom. Um, and, uh, you know, they're pushing this idea that, you know, Ithaca right now has made a commitment to be net zero by 2030, right? You know, if they're saying essentially, it was, I think the caption on their latest Twitter was like, you know, Ithaca is doing this by 2030, why not Cambridge? Well, I have an answer. I'm not, I'm not on Twitter, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what the answer is. Well, Ithaca gets 80% of their power from nuclear and hydroelectric. Um, so, it was like shoot, so solving the problem for them is more like shooting fish in a barrel. Well, but, 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 but so their, their program is also voluntary. It also is funded by a hundred million dollar, has a hundred million dollar starting seed money for low interest loans that people can voluntarily initiate to upgrade their building. So there's money at, a, at almost a zero interest rate. And they already have some of the clean grid energy that we don't have. We have about 15 to 20%, depending on who you talk to, going into the river of electricity that feeds us that is considered to be green. The idea is that 2050, it will all be green, and then we can electrify our buildings and you know, upgrade. So, um, so we, we only have about less than 30 seconds here for this segment, but we will be back I mean, three, three minutes later. But it's, it sort of brings us again to the question of are we having the wrong conversation? Because much of this conversation should be happening with entities like Eversource, it seems. Yeah. And people and, who know what they're talking about. Just Yeah. These, there are the, you know, there's sort of the bigger view, I think, that needs to be addressed here rather than just the small stuff. So anyway, we're going to take a break here, but we'll be back in three minutes on Cambridge Inside Out. <laughs> 